Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I apologize that I'm in a, in a green T-shirt. I've just got on an airplane and uh, I won't tell you where we're from, uh, but I've made it to speak to you today and I hope um, you find this interesting. So I'm going to take you through this presentation. So we're in the business of solving the global problem of maritime domain awareness. And we've all got used to knowing lots of information about what goes on in the land, in the cities and whatnot. But actually, the marine domain, which is about 75% of the world's surface, is largely unknown. I mean, you hear anecdotal evidence that the moon is better known than the marine domain, and this is true, and yet 90% of our trade all comes across the sea. And it's not just the big vessels. We've seen uh, the Evergreen get stuck in the Suez Canal. Those sorts of size vessels are about 180,000 vessels of the world's 26 million. And what we do is provide technology and systems that enable people to understand what's going on and therefore improve safety, improve commercial efficiency, and improve uh, security. And those of you that, that follow this sort of stuff will know that places like Southeast China Sea, uh, Middle East, and of course now uh, um, the Eastern Med and up into the Black Sea and uh, the Bosphorus Straits is a, is, a, is a big problem. So security is an issue, and we're solving that uh, problem with our systems and technology. We're an established business. We've been around for a number of years, and we're now finally entering a rapid growth phase. Those of you that have been shareholders, perhaps a little bit jaded with how long it has taken, but we're not an app for that. We're a company that have developed real products that are complex, by nature. So when you're developing transceivers and things like that, it takes a long time to get to there. So what's driving that growth? There's a huge market. It's a multi-billion dollar market. It ranges from security to safety to commercial and environmental monitoring of the seas, the coastline and waterways. Um, just to give you one stat, the EU inland waterways alone is 52,000 kilometers. Uh, we talk about the Philippines where we are building the world's largest fisheries program as 2 million square kilometers of what we call exclusive economic zone. Uh, so the market is there and it is demanding these systems and technologies to reveal what is going on. And we have the product courtesy of those many years of development and they fit with the requirements, they're proven. So this isn't, uh, you know, like a lot of technology businesses, you know, an idea or a prototype. These are products that are proven in the market with references. Uh, we've manufactured and shipped over 340,000 navigation transponders, and we have signed over 70 million pounds worth of system contracts. So it's not all just, it's going to happen, it is happening. And what is driving that growth, and what makes it capable of that, is we've structured the business so that we can scale. We have 1,100 partners around the world that are helping us deliver those, whether they're a small dealer that are buying a black box, or whether they're a big systems integrator, perhaps like in the Middle East, that is enabling us to deliver our systems. And that means that from our core technology and products, we're able to scale and operate globally as we are. So as I just said, multi-billion dollar market, but we target certain segments of that market. And on our system side of our business, we're targeting fisheries. Of those 26 million boats, 4 million of those are fishing boats. And overfishing of our seas is a massive issue. And today, maybe 1% of those vessels are tracked, and you need to track them to enforce their quotas. Coast guards, you have security concerns. That little picture there is the Bahrain Coast Guard who apprehended that boat, which was on its way to the Four Seasons, full of Kalashnikovs and bullets, and that was detected using our system. Navigation, you've now got autonomous navigation happening. You've seen the safety concerns and the problems that happen if one ship gets stuck in a key waterway. And obviously, I think we're all aware of the environment. And I think the interesting parallel for me is air traffic control. In the 60s, air traffic control was just controlled by the defense agencies. And they would then monitor some of the civilian aircraft. And then some bright persons said, actually, most of the aircraft are civilian. So we need to create that. We need to create that uh, uh, national uh, air traffic control system for civilian aircraft. And today, if we roll forward, there are it's a nine billion dollar a year market, but there's only thirty thousand commercial aircraft. Contrast that with twenty six million boats, of which eight million are commercial. So you can see where the scale of the of the market and the market opportunities and the drivers, as I've said, are security, safety, sustainability 
and the economics of, of moving stuff uh, uh, around the world. So as I said, we've got proven market leading products and technologies. We have our digital AIs transponders. We've shipped about 340,000 of those. This presentation is a couple of months old, so that's now nearly 360,000 of those. And then we have what are called our integrated MDA system. And this is essentially, that's a picture of one of the command centers in the Philippines. And essentially, it is like air traffic control, but for boats, with an awful lot of intelligence in there. And we've signed £70 million worth of contracts with sovereigns at the moment. And we have a contract pipeline of £600 million worth, which I will talk you through uh, a little bit later. Where do our revenues come from? <clears throat> we have both repeat and recurring revenues. So the way we define repeat revenues, repeat revenue is where we have a single customer who keeps placing new orders. So a repeat revenue might be we have a Coast Guard that has bought a system, but they then need to keep building that system. No, we never have a customer with these national scale systems where they, where they design a system all as one. It's a bit like building an airline. They, they start with buying an A320, then they buy two more, then they buy a 777, then they buy a 747, etc. We don't call that recurring revenue, even though we know that that will come. It's repeat revenue because each one is a contract. We then have recurring revenue where we have longer term contracts, where data sales, so we buy from various satellites, we fuse that together into a single data stream and we stream that into their monitoring system. And they are long term contracts and they're needing that. It's kind of like the food for the systems. And so the recurring revenues are data sales and support services, which will grow in the long term, a little bit like the insurance business. And then we have software and hardware, they're delivered together, which is our repeat revenues. And that is the same across our transceivers business and our systems business. So as I said, we have two distinct divisions. We have our transceivers division and we have our systems division. Transceivers division is selling black boxes to marine electronics manufacturers and also to a network of our own dealers under our own brand. And our systems division, which is I suppose is the one has the much larger contract opportunity, is where we deliver a turnkey maritime surveillance system. And that will vary according to the customer in terms of its size. So transceivers division, I've given you some of the highlights there. So there's 26 million boats all milling around. And there's a new bunch of technology, the communications that are now coming to the marine domain. It moves much slower than the mobile phone market. So if you're a mariner, you'll know that you need to use VHF communications, which is provides boat to boat voice communication. And some years ago, they introduced a thing called AIS, Automatic Identification System, which enabled data to be exchanged in real time between multiple elements. It's what's called a, a mesh network. And it basically means that boats in, out in the, at the sea can communicate with each other automatically. And originally, it was designed to avoid collision. And then ports realized, well, actually, if I receive that uh, transmission, much the same as Flight Tracker, I can see when those boats are coming over, uh, over the horizon, and I can plan my port, et cetera, around that. So you now have these two communication mechanisms, which are used basically are digitizing the communications in the marine domain. And what are those applications? Well, traffic control, particularly for the big ports and uh, things. Navigation safety, that's not just about the big ship. If you've got a 30-foot speedboat and you want to go across to France, you're going across shipping lanes. If you're in Florida and Miami and you're trying to come out, you've got tugboats and things. If you're in Maine, you've got fog and things. And so these transponders enable you to see what's going on around you. And it's now becoming a, an essential safety item on the boats. And we just see that growth being driven by that. Environment monitoring is a relatively new thing. We've all seen buoys dotted around ports and things like that. They're now putting electronic transponders on there with sensors, which will then tell you the salinity, the quality of the water. Has there been pollution at the same time as a boat goes past? Therefore, you can attribute it to that particular boat. All those sorts of things are now growing, and they have special transponders to go on those buoys. And of course, autonomous shipping, which I suppose is similar to traffic control. But in our world, the autonomous shipping is all about giving a vessel a breadcrumb that it follows automatically within a navigation traffic lane and to have the technology that stops them from bumping into each other. Just the same as on the road, but it's a little bit less complex in the marine domain. So these are the markets that we are addressing. So what about this business? Whilst it's small in its potential compared to our systems business, I think it's not to be forgotten. This year, it did about £8 million. The year 
that we're now in, it should do perhaps 11 million pounds, depending on availability of components and therefore production, our ability to meet demand. And within a year or so of that, we expect that to then be a 20, 25 million pound business because of a new product that we're introducing. So we have an existing product range of black box AIS transponders, and we have a new product that will sit alongside that that fuses AIS and VHF communication into a single box and provides some innovative functionality around that. So within a single item, you're able to, in the marine domain, communicate data-wise and voice-wise. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail on that because that is a, a new product that we'll be launching in October and we'll be starting to ship in Q1. So our systems market, obviously there's ports and all sorts of stuff, but our focus and what we've built the system to do is to service national scale civil defense agencies, and there are two in any country. One is a Coast Guard and the second is the National Fisheries Agency. Coast Guard is looking to have intelligence-led operations. Uh, typically today, a Coast Guard will have lots of patrol boats and they will mill around and go out and patrol uh, and randomly come across events. Actually, what they want is intelligence from a persistent surveillance system that says, uh, off Papua New Guinea in the eastern part of uh, Indonesia is where some things that are suspicious, it looks like transshipment or smuggling is going on, therefore they dispatch the patrol boats there. Um, that makes it much more efficient because these things are burning huge amounts of fuel, wear and tear millions and millions of dollars, um, as well as if they don't have that intelligence, they miss the bad guy anyway. On the national fishing agencies, there's been a lot of regulation about, so for example, the fish that you and I eat that we buy in Tesco's, particularly things like tuna, it has to be caught by a boat that was operating legally. But how do you know if it's operating legally unless it's been tracked? And so if you take Philippines, for example, they're initially tracking their largest uh, tuna clippers, which go out into the Western Pacific and catch the tuna. And the reason they started doing that a number of years ago was because they could not export the fish to the EU. But that accounts for about 1% of the fishing boats. What these agencies have now realized is they need to control all the smaller boats because that's actually where the illegal fishing is. That doesn't sit well perhaps on CNN and BBC because you don't see the Chinese uh, uh, factory boat on the horizon and all the rest of it. But the reality is most of the illegal fishing is done by the small fishing boats. And so they're looking to have national scale systems that enable those boats to be tracked and to monitor the catches. Those are the two markets that we that we address. And in both those markets, we are not out trying to sell a system. They are coming to us and making an inquiry saying, we want to have a monitoring system. And then we start quite a long process, sales process, consulting with them to, to define what that is, get them to understand what that is, how are they going to operate it in reality, because they go from really having nothing other than bits of paper and no visibility to actually having a digital system where everything is there in front of them. And actually problems they didn't realize was there are, are, are there. I mean, a good example is Bahrain, where we installed a system nearly seven, eight years ago. And when they switched it on, in the first week, they had 6,000 alerts. And previously, they thought they only had 10 transgressions each week. So what is our SRT MDA system? It's in two parts. We have sensors and we have the monitoring system. Our magic source is the monitoring system that integrates all that information from the sensors. And when we talk about the sensors, as you can see on this little diagram here, we have platforms, which are satellites, patrol boats, coast stations, and drones. And on those platforms, you put sensors, and those sensors might be a camera, radar, RF detection. They are all accumulating data. And we buy those in from third parties and things. The hard part is integrating that all together so that all that data is fused together, and then analyzing that data so you can detect the targets, determine what's a seagull and what's a boat, and determine the behavior of that boat so you know that that boat is fishing illegally or is fishing legally, or that boat is doing transshipment and it looks like smuggling or people smuggling, or that looks like a possible terrorist attack. And that's behavioral analytics, and it's integrating that within all the command centers and operators so they can actually do something about it. But our customer wants us to deliver the whole thing. Our derivation of value is right at the core of that, is taking the data and making sense of that and delivering that intelligence and then the command and control that goes after that. And so the way that ends up is that our system delivers this multi-sensor fusion, which enables them to track and identify 
any vessel on a mass scale. So you're talking, you know, uh, huge amounts of data. You then have to analyze that huge amounts of data to find the few percentage of vessels that are doing something wrong. You then have an integrated command and control. So you have operators in different places. If you take the Philippines, there are 17 different offices spread right the way across the country. Each of those have got two or three operators. They all work in real time in a secure environment because of our, our GEOVIS system. We then have specialist functionality, things like aquatic modeling, um, the ability for the fishermen to electronically uh, record on their phones what they're catching, and that's transmitted back. And the other key point with our system is these countries are not interested in cloud-based systems. Much the same as us. When it really comes to, I mean, if you're flying into, into Heathrow, I don't think many of us would be comfortable to know that they were using Flight Tracker for that. You want to know it's the national, you know, it's Nats that's doing it. It's a professional system. It's ex under the control here and not in a Google service somewhere in case we get cut off and things. So it's exactly the same in these countries. Uh, they use some web services in the interim, but actually what they want to build over the next 10, 20 years are these huge national national uh, uh, maritime uh, um, uh, surveillance systems. So as I've said, <clears throat> the system then integrates it all. We use the core of this magic source, as I call it, is our GeoViz application, which has taken about eight years for us to develop. It's a very big, complex application, and that integrates all of these coast stations, patrol vessels, human intelligence and satellites all together and enables a system operator so if you take, again, somebody, I don't know, let's say in Bahrain or Saudi Arabia, if they had a console, they would be able to see all of those sensors all on their screen immediately. And so that operator console, so each operator console then has a range of functionality. So you have the chart displays where they can see the boats moving around. The system is driven by analytics, so providing with an alert. When you have an alert, we use gaming technology to then visualize that in what we call dynamic 3D as well as having e-logs and all the historical information on that target. Then they look at what action to take. So you categorize that alert. Again, this is all done automatically. If it's a low categorization, maybe the guy gets a text message to say, we caught you illegally fishing, don't do it again. Or maybe if it's a terrorist thing, then they dispatch a armed patrol vessel or helicopter to go and, to go and deal with it. So there's a whole process all within a command and control structure. So if you're talking about, uh, we've got a pending project coming up later this year where there's 3,000 uh, people within the, uh, the Coast Guard. Um, they will have uh, five uh, offices. Each of those will have 10 operators. Those 50 operators will all have different responsibilities in command and control and commanders. And you know, anybody can't just go and uh, uh, authorize a helicopter to go. So all of that is embedded in the system of full full workflow for them. So the other thing to consider here is we've done this before, we're proven, and that's very important, I think, for you and when you're weighing up us as an investment proposition and also for our customers, and it makes a big difference. We have the ability to deliver these contracts. We've learned a lot of lessons along the way. We we're pretty naive when we started. I would say totally naive when we started. We didn't understand government processes, procurement processes, how long these things would take. Uh, I got that wrong on many occasions. We still get that wrong, frankly. Um, problems on the ground with installing in places like the Middle East and South America and stuff. But we've now developed a very robust model of doing that. It's not without problems, uh, but um, uh, we now have the capabilities, the resources to do it. Uh, the little pictures here, this is a uh, signing of our contract with Bahrain. We always sign directly with the government. It's typically with the Ministry of Interior. And then we contract a local partner, who then helps us with the installation. Picture to the right of that is the Philippine Fisheries Command Center, which is the world's most sophisticated and largest fisheries monitoring system now. The one to the right of that is a transponder, which goes on the vessels. This is on a tuna fishing boat, which is off somewhere in the Western Pacific, catching tuna that will appear maybe in a week or two in Waitrose. On the left at the bottom are some of the data servers that we now build up, put our GeoVis software on, and then we ship out. These were prepared just prior to us signing a contract that we did in January. Those servers then go into a data center, which is the one on the right, which is then prepared in country. We build towers. This is a tower in Southeast Asia that we built that we then put sensors on. So we've been there, done it, got the T-shirt. Um, it's been a long road in developing the technology and then developing the ability and the model to be able to scale. 
and finding the right partners, all of those ingredients to bake that cake. Um, but I, in my view, that gives us a very defensible moat around this business, like with our transceivers, where you've got to develop the transceiver technology. There isn't, um, uh, I don't know if many of you know about mobile phones, but uh, um, Apple doesn't develop its own 3G chip. That comes from Qualcomm. Uh, there isn't a marine communications chip somewhere. We develop it from scratch. So that's uh, 18 months of 10 talented engineers to create that. Similarly with these systems, it's years to develop that system that it's absolutely mission critical, robust, and reliable. Your, your reputation in the market for reliability and your ability to actually deliver these things and maintain them going forward. So it's not a, um, uh, for those of you that are new to us, you know, we're, we're, we're an overnight success after quite a few years. So where's the growth coming on our systems division? We have 70 million pounds worth of existing contracts. That includes a £32 million fisheries contract that we're coming to the end of in the Philippines. There will be further contracts after that as they then build up the system. That will complete at the end of this year. We then signed another contract, £40 million in January in the Middle East. And we've shipped the first products there and it actually installations are now ongoing. This is a two-year program for us to install it. Now they want that uh, reduced to a year. I think um, we'll do the majority of it in a year, but not uh, not all of it. And again, they're already talking about the next expansion of that system, as we would expect. We then have this thing called a validated sales pipeline. And this is something, this is a tool that we use to manage our resources. We get inquiries all the time. As I said earlier, I'm not trying to persuade anybody to have a maritime surveillance system. To do that is a folly, is a complete waste of time. We have customers come to us make inquiries either through our network of 1,100 partners or directly they find us because of our, our heritage and, and our, our position in AIS and say, so I want a mar maritime surveillance uh, system. It's very easy to fly all around the world, spend lots of time with people who don't have the money, uh, yet they haven't got political um, uh, buy into it yet. Um, it's just an idea, etc. And so we spend 90% of our time on those opportunities where They've had proposals, they've accepted proposals, um, that we are in deep consultation with them about what actually will be their first implementation of a maritime domain surveillance system. Uh, we can see that they're looking for sites for things. Um, it's a con heavy consultation phase. And also they have, uh, in principle, budget approval uh, to proceed. Obviously, you can't get, you know, they don't have, to have, have the money sitting in the bank until such time as they've finalized exactly what they want, apply for that budget, and away they go. And typically, we expect that uh, from when they make their first inquiry, if they're serious, uh, anywhere from two to five years before they start going. Today, we have about £600 million worth of prospect contracts in our pipeline. There are about £50 million worth that we expect. We were expecting prior to COVID. It then got delayed because of COVID. And then they re-engaged at the beginning of last year. They recently had a presidential election, which has now been completed. And so we're expecting that now to happen in the coming month or so. And also, we have a new project um, of about £130 million, which is, in the, which is in the Asia region, which we think we did think would be not till the end of next year, but that now seems to be likely at the end of this year. And we'll take uh, about a year to, uh, to implement. So of that 600 million, we have about 180 million where we really see that is, 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 is within the next year to sign and then uh, a year or two to, uh, to implement. At the same time, as they convert out of the BSP into contract, there's more stuff that will then gradually uh, uh, come in as the discussions that we're having with places like in South America and other projects with existing customers um, uh, mature. So this rather complicated looking diagram was perhaps our poor attempt at trying to give you a bit of granularity to that. So I'm just going to talk you through that. Our broker has put out a forecast for this year. And that forecast is, as you can see, is the gray H1, H2 of 2022-23. We have not put out a forecast for next financial year or the year after that. The reason for that is the sums are so big and we do not want to get our forecasting wrong. So we will extend and upgrade our forecasting when contracts are signed. So for this year, what we have assumed is our transceiver business growing at uh, 10%. We expect it to grow substantially more than that. The remainder of our Philippine 
fisheries program. And we've also put in two thirds of some of the Coast Guard projects that we expect to get this year, which you can see is G2. Nothing else is in that forecast. We are also hopeful and expectant that G3 and G6 will come in this year, and that will then enable us to then amend those forecasts accordingly. So our attempt here was to try to give, I believe that you know, if you're going to invest in a company, um, you know, it's much easier for me actually not to say anything because then I don't get beaten up when I get it wrong. But I actually believe it's better to give a commentary as much as I can as to what's going on in our systems business and what's coming up, so you can ga gauge what uh, make it make make a hopefully an informed um, investment decision. But our focus are the ones uh, in the in the grey and the ones with the high uh, timing confidence, and that's where we're really focusing our time, and we have very good visibility on those. So in terms of the contract dynamics, when we sign a contract and a system, a system is essentially broken up into four things. The monitoring system, which is our software and the servers and things. The coast stations, which are the things that the servers go on. The transponders that go on the boats. And then the services such as data and what have you. And the first three are divided into two milestones. So the first thing, obviously, you've got to sign the thing. And I should actually say we're... In, in, the, in the ones that I just spoken, we're a passenger to that process. Once you get past a certain stage, they need to process their paperwork. There's nothing, and you know, often you know, people are frustrated with them and say, look, you've got to go out and tell them to sign it. You, you can't go and tell the government to sign anything. You know, they follow their process. Once they've told you they're doing it, so the, the contract we signed in January, we knew a year ago, but it took them a year to, 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 to process that. And typically, once you know, it takes between, um, well, a year is extreme, but between uh, um, six and a, one month and six months before they sign. But once they've signed, the first milestone is the shipping of the equipment. So we have the equipment, we buy it, we ship it out there, uh, they accept that equipment, and then they pay us typically 50% of the value of that equipment. The next thing is once that's there, we then go and install it. And the installation milestone is then M2. And so once that's installed, then you get 40%. So, uh, and that follows right the way through the coast stations. The M1 is a little bit, takes a little bit longer because we are buying third party product. And that's not just sitting on a shelf like a pack of polos that often has made for you. And the installation can take a little bit longer. But actually, you're also creating the infrastructure on which that's going to be fitted whilst you're doing that. These are the payment milestones. Every project has lots of you know, project milestones that are all being done in between all of that. And then finally, that all culminates in M3 which is when the system, which is what they want, is all operating and we get our final 10%. On the services, and that's the recurring revenue, so that might be support, but actually the meaningful stuff is data, uh, they then start to buy that once they consume it. And then you build them on a monthly basis. So that's each system contract. We then need to look at each system customer. So the way we look at it is a customer as an account. We look at BFAR in the Philippines as an account. We look at Barring Coast Guard as an account. Yes, they bought a system, but then they're looking already the one we announced in January. I'm there in a couple of weeks' time, and we are making a final proposal for a, a next generation of system that adds additional capability. It's because our systems like Lego onto the system they bought. So you have this succession of system contracts. Sometimes it can be years uh, in between the two, sometimes it can be a year or so. We're building our business for the long term to grow and to be a sizable company. And so each of these customers, you know, I don't think there is a single system customer that doesn't contact us and say, right, we've got a 10-year plan that we want to build our, our maritime surveillance capabilities. Let's start with an initial system and then build up. So we have that pattern of, uh, of, do, of doing that. And hopefully that, for those of you that uh, um, uh, are interested, that, it, that explains how those revenues and the cash uh, works. The key thing on these projects is they become cash positive on the monitoring system at M1. Prior to that, it's cash negative. Nobody pays you up front. So forget that idea, governments don't do that. The good thing about the monitoring systems is the value is in the software, so it's, that is an extremely profitable milestone, if you will, much more so than the transponders, which are quite capital heavy. So that then gives us the work the capital for those projects, which then enables us to take on all these uh, projects and scale. Summary, big market, 
there's some long-term macro drivers, which is the digitization of the marine domain and people wanting to know what's going on. We are the leader in this area. Um, if you're in the industry, SRT is acknowledged as the leader. Everybody knows us. We have a differentiated product, so our transceivers are known to work better than anybody else's. Why the U.S. Coast Guard buys from us, RNLI, Trinity House, Touch Lifeboats, uh, you name it, they buy from us. And on our systems, it's that high level of integration and the analytics. We have a scalable business model. We're not trying to do all the installations all around the world. We have a team that supports local partners. We have 1,100 of them all around uh, the world. We have a proven uh, management team. Um, I know you're seeing me, but they, there's a, quite a deep knowledge and capability within SRT. Um, and we have this combination of repeat and compound recurring revenues. And we've got a big pipeline of contracts that we need to convert. So this is the management team. You don't need to hear about me anymore. Richard Hurd, ACA, accountant, very experienced now in international finance. We've never had a bad debt, credibly, in nearly 15 years. Neil, who's our COO, he is a um, chartered engineer, looks after all the product development and manufacturing. John Francois was in the French Navy at a very senior level, comes with unrivaled product expertise, and he is defining the product and the features and stuff that our development team is then implementing, that our sales team is then selling. And on our NEDs, Kevin Finn, who's had an awful lot of international business around logistics. Our business in the end is about logistics. There's no question about people buying our stuff in the end. It's how we deliver that. He comes to the automotive sector, and he brings a lot of knowledge about how you scale at a very high level across lots of different countries in a very reliable fashion. Simon Burrell, he has a deep financial knowledge. And Simon Rogers was one of the original backers of, of SRT, very successful entrepreneur, and just brings this passionate view to everything in the interests of, of shareholders. So that's SRT. Uh, I think I've um, waffled on enough. And now we've got a few questions. Tremendous. Thank you very much, Simon. When Nexus was launched to the OEMs, was take-up as successful as anticipated? I wouldn't say take-up. So we introduced it to OEMs. So, so it, you, you don't just go and have a meeting and the OEM says, great, sign here. So um, we had the strong interest that we wanted from the OEMs that we had targeted. And we had uh, specific ones in mind, one of whom is uh, already a customer. And now we're in the engineering discussion as to how they're going to integrate that within their systems. So uh, I was very pleased with the response and those discussions are going on. Are they going to um, adopt that into their product portfolio? Yes. It's a question of, of how they do that in, in, in phases. So we're very happy with that at the moment. Thank you very much. And with inflation running wild at this present time, what do you think will be the effect on SRT this year? So it's pain. Um, so there's two things. It's going to affect us all, isn't it? Prices going up is, is the simple. So the cost of our products are going up. So whether we buy a server, it goes up, or uh, uh, components. Um, but you see the 9%, I read today, it's 9% now is, the, is, is, is inflation. Um, we see in the electronic components on our transponders business that it's supply, it's the lack of supply. And so you're getting decommits. So for, I'll give you an example. When we make a comp a transponder. Typically, there's 100 components from about 30 different suppliers around the world. And our manufacturer does all that ordering. And normally, normal times, it would take six months. And they would be delivered staggered on that period of time. So on the six-month day, they're all there, and you assemble them. It only takes a day to assemble them, and out pops a transponder. What's happening today is the lead times are 12 to 18 months. And in some instances, people aren't even telling you. So now what we do is go into the gray market to buy components along with everybody else supply and demand means that which is where the inflation is actually coming from means that components go up in price that increases the cost of our products so on the transceivers what we've uh, we've done is we've increased all our prices um, and we have that market power to do that it has not diminished demand whatsoever so but, but we still can't make enough of it because you still got to find these things um, and you can find them if you're prepared to pay a premium but sometimes that premium can be enormous. And to give you an example, one component that normally costs us $6, the other day we had to pay $110 for it. And we had, our supply chain had two hours to make that decision, or it's gone to somebody else. Now, 
the way we handle that is we then charge that premium directly to the customer. And some of them aren't very happy about that because they're like, oh, well, I've, you know, I've, I, I, I ordered it $500. Why are you charging me $650? And we explain to them and we find that people then say, well, all right, there's nowhere else to get that product. We will take it. So that is how we are, we are managing it on our transceivers business so that we don't reduce our margin. On our system side of our business, we always have a margin of error that we uh, factor into our, um, our proposals. Um, and, you know, with the inflation running at 10%, we need to consider that the baseline cost of those projects in two years' time that we're quoting today will perhaps be 20% higher. And so that's reflected in our, in our quotation. Uh, I think the short answer to your question is we're very aware of it. And like any other business, we need to roll with the punches. Where we've got a slight benefit is on our systems business, we have high margins. And we, I think across both of them, we have the power to price to accommodate that. And unfortunately, you know, it, it manifests inflation, doesn't it, as a result of that? Thank you very much. I think you've probably covered the supply chain and securing components bit of it, although it might be good to say how widespread that is, whether it's just a few components or a lot. But you mentioned exploring some grey market purchases. Are there any quality control issues with this path? So I'll ask the first bit on whether it's wide, widespread. It's random. It's random. So this morning, uh, I can tell you it's uh, the Wi-Fi module that comes from Ublox in Switzerland, suddenly not available. So now we have to go into the gray market. Whereas last week, orders were confirmed from that. So it's random. What I would say, because it all sounds very dramatic, is when you're making electronics, whether you're Dell or your Apple or your little old SRT, there's always times when components don't get delivered on time. And you always have to go into the gray market. The difference now is there's a lot more of it. And I think it will, that situation will be around for the next 12 months. And then it's going to be like a fat ball suddenly spitting out. And there's going to be a glut because you can be sure that all the semi and the fabs are, are re reacting uh, um, to that. Um, Tanjan, can you remind me of the second part of that question, please? Yes. With the grey market purchases, are there any quality control issues with this path? Thank you. So, uh, yes, there are, because obviously that if you can buy a component for $6 and sell it for $110, you're going to have people trying to pass off different components and things. We have a dedicated supply chain uh, department um, that works with Flextronics, which is the world's second largest electronics manufacturer. And we are super careful about where we buy our components from. We only buy them from validated sources. Um, you know, we, we hear horror stories of lots of electronic companies that just, you know, just go off and buy stuff randomly and they all, all over the place. It's not just from China. It could be from Coventry, where, you know, anywhere where there's a stockholder and stuff's out of date or it's not packaged right and all that sort of stuff. And it just doesn't work. In sensitive electronics and performance electronics, it doesn't work. So quality is number one. We've built our reputation on quality and we will not squander that. And that just comes from being rigorous about where you buy the stuff and the checking of that. And thus far, we've not had an issue. And we won't have an issue, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm certain of that. Thank you very much. And there's sometimes news articles about possible stress on government's finances around the world, made worse by the strong dollar. Are things looking okay as far as you can tell with your current customers and those expecting to be signing soon? Well, the strong dollar benefits us because it converts into sterling. So already on our uh, contract that we signed in, uh, in the Middle East, We've increased our profit because of the, uh, the fluctuation of the dollar. Um, it doesn't really affect. We don't see any effect actually on our on the, the the customers we've got in our validated sales pipeline on their on their finances. These are important strategic uh, projects. The sums, you know, if you take um, I don't know the, 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 one of the bigger ones in Southeast Asia, 130 million pounds, 180 million dollars. It's actually a relatively small proportion of their of their GDP. It's seen as strategically important. The only thing that did stop it was COVID because they thought, you know, with all the drama in the press, it was an existential threat. And they just put all resources into vaccines and medical stuff and all that sort of stuff. So at the moment, we don't see anything. And I don't, I don't anticipate anything at, uh, at, at this level. I think it just sort of just drones on, perhaps not as quickly as we would want. But um, as I said earlier in my presentation, we've now arrived at that point where 
know, it won't be one contract every two or three years. Hopefully it'll be two or three contracts a year. And where are things at with regulation in terms of any regulation that's going to stipulate that more demand for your products? So our transponders business, uh, separate to the systems business, the transponders business, you have the IMO, which regulates international waters as an umbrella organization, and they have a regulation that any uh, ship over 300 tons in international waters has to have a transponder. And that's been in, the, in, in place since 2002 and will carry on. So every time a new ship is built, it goes and buys a whole bunch of navigation stuff for its, um, its, its bridge, and one of those is an air transponder. You then have national and regional regulations. So in Europe, if you're a fishing boat over 12 meters, you have to have an AIS transponder. If you're an inland waterway vessel, you have to have an AIS transponder. Uh, if you're a commercial boat in the Seychelles now, you need to have a AIS transponder. So there's a patchwork of regulation that requires people to have transponders and then they enforce them uh, uh, sometimes poorly and sometimes, sometimes well. Um, on our systems business, it's not about regulation because we're, 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 we're providing a, a, a monitoring system. Whether they, so for example, in the Middle East where we're now doing this new project, they have now decided they're going to regulate all boats to have a identification transponder and they will, and they will enforce that. But that's kind of independent, although to some degree linked with the monitoring system, but then independent of that. They don't regulate a monitoring system. They want to have that, uh, that, 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 that monitoring system. So it's a combination on the system. There's, there is regulation around, around places. I mean, a good example is in the Philippines where they've regulated uh, fishermen to have a transponder and the fishermen are saying they don't want to have it and they're fighting them in the court and everything else. But in the meantime, the country is implementing its monitoring system. Thank you very much. And what's the post-sale support and service expectation for SRT? Do you have any challenges using third-party companies for installations, commissioning and support? We always have challenges. Um, the, key with, the key is to find the right partner. And we have, our model is we have one partner in a country. And we choose that very carefully. If you remember, when we, before we get a contract, we'll have been in that country for two, three, four years. We will have met lots of local partners around the place. And we very carefully decide who is going to be our local partner. We then get married, effectively. We're joined at the hip. And they get paid a fixed fee to do the installation work and to then do the ongoing support afterwards. And they get paid that fee when we get paid. So our success together is completely linked. And that's been extremely successful. But it does come from choosing the right, the right, uh, the right partner. Um, I suppose that's, that's always the way in life. Um, uh, the way we manage that then is we have for each project a dedicated project manager who works hand in hand with the project manager of the local partner. And they are then supported by our delivery team, which sits in the UK, which comprises of a PMO group, so a project management office, and an uh, engineering support team, which is a bunch of engineers that will go out and train up that in-country partner. And when we do the first project with that in-country partner, there's quite a lot of heavy lifting to train them up. But then, of course, once they're trained up, they can then look after things and carry on. And we have a support uh, structure where we have L1, where we train the actual customer, their, their IT department and their service people. So a Coast Guard has a lot of technical capability to look after the system. L2, which is the local partner who has the ability to go in and change bits of equipment and stuff. And L3 is it comes back to us, and that's when everything's gone wrong. Uh, and um, just to give you an example, in Bahrain, in eight years, there's never been an L3 call. There's barely been an, LT, an L2 call just where a server has gone down. It's just been repla replaced. So there isn't a lot of uh, support that actually is required to be delivered. We're very cautious and very rigid in our structure to deliver that. Tremendous. Thank you very much. And we've got one final question at this stage. Do you have any forecasts for revenue and profits for this year? And if so, what are they? Yes. If you go and look at FinCap, they have a research note out. If you can't get it, email us and we'll send it to you. We'll arrange for it to be sent to you. But there are forecasts out for this year. Yes. Many thanks, Simon, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you all for joining.